Our scripture reading for this morning and for the next couple of weeks comes from Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. One day Jesus was standing beside Lake Gennesaret, which is also known as the Sea of Galilee, when the crowd pressed in around him to hear God's word. Jesus saw two boats sitting by the lake. The fishermen had gone ashore and were washing their nets. Jesus boarded one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, then asked him to row out a little distance from the shore. Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he finished speaking to the crowds, he said to Simon, row out farther into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. Simon replied, Master, we've worked hard all night and caught nothing. But because you say so, I'll drop the nets. So they dropped the nets, and their catch was so huge that their nets were splitting. They signaled for their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They filled both boats so full that they were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw the catch, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Leave me, Lord, for I'm a sinner. Peter and those with him were overcome with amazement because of the number of fish they caught. James and John, Zebedee's sons, were Simon's partners, and they were amazed too. Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. As soon as they brought the boats to the shore, they left everything and followed Jesus. The word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. They had to be exhausted, right? Simon and James and John and whatever other fishing partners they had. They had to be tired, and I would bet also a bit cranky. Anybody ever been up all night and a little cranky in the morning? Yeah? I mean, they had been not just up all night. They were fishing all night. And in the first century, this was grueling work. The most basic way to fish was with a casting net. Has anyone ever fished with a casting net? Big circular net, got weights on it, you toss it out, sinks down, catches some fish. And we have this very complicated invention called a rope that we use to pull it back up. And some people in Jesus' day did that. Uh, But then you still have to deal with the weight of the fish and the drag of the water. But a lot of people in Jesus' day, there was no rope. You had to dive down or squat down or get down and gather it up yourself and lift it over and over and over again. But we know from this story that they were fishing at night, and when you fish at night, it usually went a different way. You used what was called a trammel net. It had three layers to it. One was a wide net, wide opening net, and then there'd be two layers of finer mesh on either side, and the idea was that you would deploy it parallel to shore, a little ways out, and then you would let everything get still and wait for the fish to come back and start feeding on the vegetation. I don't know if any of you ever watched biblical TV shows or movies and it looks like everything is the desert, but the Sea of Galilee is actually, that region is actually quite green. And so the fish would come in and start to feed on the vegetation and then you would scare the fish. You'd say, boo, or not really. You'd probably just like, you'd run through the water, you would slap the water with an oar, or if the net was far enough out, you might actually sail in between the shore and the net. It would cause the fish to bolt toward the deep water, and then they would hit the net. And they would push the fine mesh through the bigger mesh and essentially bag themselves in the net where they couldn't get out. And then, what do you have to do again? Drag it to shore. And um, this was something that they would do all night, right? Because this wasn't just a hobby for them. Simon and their crew, this was, they weren't doing this for fun. This was their job. This was their livelihood. Their families counted on them being successful at this. Who else counted on them being successful? The fish market, right? And then the people that would buy the fish at the market. So it was a lot of pressure. It was a lot of work. You didn't just go out and do a little like you did it all night, every night. And on a good night, all of this work was worth it. But this was not a good night. How many fish did they catch that night? How many fish did they catch that night? None. Zero. A grueling night of work for nothing. And even on a night of catching nothing, your job was not over at sunrise. It's like, oh, well, bummer, all right, let's all move on to the next thing. Fishermen and women, what do you still have to do at the end of fishing? Clean up. 
clean the nets, repair the nets, clean the boats, get everything stocked away or put in the right place for the next night of fishing. My guess is they were exhausted, they were frustrated, and they just either wanted to go drink a mimosa or go to bed. Anybody ever have a night like that or a day like that? Nothing goes right. And not just like, oh, it was a bad day. Like, nothing goes right. It feels like all of your efforts are wasted. It feels like you failed at everything that you tried. Nothing to show for your work. And you just want the day to end. You just want the night to end. I picture Simon and James and John washing their nets in a basin of fresh water on the shore. And they hear this strange sound, kind of like a commotion, shuffling of feet. And they look up and there's a large crowd starting to amass on the the shore of the lake, but not just anywhere on the lake, like right by their boats. What's the most expensive and valuable thing they owned? Their boats. I can just hear Simon muttering, you have got to be kidding me, and throwing his nets down and trudging up to the shore to make sure that everything was fine, make sure no one was messing with his boat, and as he gets closer, he notices, there's someone in my boat. And just as he's about to call out and give this guy a piece of his mind, he recognizes who this man is. And who is it? It's Jesus of Nazareth. Now, we need to try to frame what this meant for Simon. So this is going to sound weird in a Christian church. Forget what you know about Jesus. Okay? Just for a moment. You can remember it again in a little bit. But let's forget what we know about Jesus, and let's figure out who Simon knew Jesus to be in this moment. This story happens in Luke chapter 5. In Luke chapter 1, we get the story of Elizabeth and Mary being pregnant with John the Baptist and Jesus, respectively. Luke chapter 2 is what story that Linus recites for us every year? Christmas. Luke chapter 2 is Christmas. Luke chapter 3 is John the Baptist's ministry and Jesus getting baptized. And then Luke chapter 4 opens with Jesus going out and being tested in the wilderness and coming back to Nazareth and and inaugurating his ministry. And then it continues, Jesus went down to the city of Capernaum in Galilee and taught the people each Sabbath. They were amazed by his teaching because he delivered his message with authority. Word was also getting around that Jesus could do some miracles. He had cast a demon out of somebody. And so to Simon, who lives in Capernaum, who is Jesus? He is a local minor celebrity. He's a great public speaker, great teacher, probably the best preacher he's ever heard. And he also seems to be someone who can maybe do miracles. That's who Jesus is. But then for Simon, it actually got personal. After leaving synagogue, Jesus went home with Simon. Simon's mother-in-law was sick with a high fever, and the family asked Jesus to help her. He bent over her and spoke harshly to the fever, and it left her. Now who is Jesus to Simon? All the same stuff, just did it for me. He's a local minor celebrity. He's a gifted teacher, best preacher I've ever heard, can definitely do at least minor miracles, and he's also someone that blessed my family or somebody that I care about. And I think at this point, Simon's relationship with Jesus looks a lot like a lot of people's relationship with Jesus. Jesus is a famous, well-known person, We like him, or at least are positively inclined toward him. We like what he said and what he did, and maybe we turn to him in times of need, and maybe he's even helped us or someone that we know. And that could even include all the way up to forgiveness for our sins and being saved in the traditional sense of the idea. I mean, do you know people whose relationship with Jesus is like this? Does this sound like your relationship with Jesus? And that's not a bad thing. That's That's a good thing. That's a really good thing, especially in today's world. You know, I'll tell you, I don't think our biggest hurdle right now is antagonism toward the church or Jesus or religion. That is always going to exist. I think the biggest hurdle right now is apathy. People just not caring, even Christians themselves not caring enough to go to church or to get involved. It it was like put on full display for me this morning. I was at Publix at 7.30 in the morning picking up the communion bread, and they have the wall of magazines, right? Right? And there's a Jesus magazine, and then a Princess Catherine magazine, and then a Shohei Otani magazine. And, you know, like there's just, Jesus is just one of many celebrities in our world today. 
So it's good that we're positively inclined toward Jesus, that we like him. It's good that we know what he taught. It's good that he's someone we turn to in a place and time of need. But the reason I'm highlighting this is because what describes many of our relationships with Jesus is actually where Simon was before he even thought about becoming a disciple. What does that say? What does that say? So this exhausted, frustrated Simon is trudging over to his boat to be sure no one's messing with it. And the only thing he wants is for this whole crowd to go away so he can finish his chores and move on to the next thing. And he sees someone is in his boat. Someone has boarded his boat without him, without his permission. I taught this story in a rural North Florida congregation over a decade ago. And there was an old farmer who used to sit on the second row because if he was further back, he couldn't hear. His name was Jack. And I said, Jack, what would you do if you came in from the field and you saw someone sitting in your truck? He says, it depends. Do I have my shotgun with me? <laughs> I mean, imagine how Peter is feeling, how Simon is feeling. This guy's got a lot of nerve getting in my person. Wait a second. Is that Jesus? And maybe it should have made sense. I mean, who else can draw a crowd first thing in the morning? Especially when you haven't caught any fish, you know? Some people might be there to try to get it fresh off the boat. But, like, why is he here? Why did he have to come here? Why is he in my boat? Well, apparently Jesus was just milling around on the shore of the Sea of Galilee. And I get it. I, I have actually visited there before. I went on a Holy Land trip. It was the first place we went. And I hated leaving. I mean, I'm glad that we went to all the other places. But I could have totally stayed uh, there on the Sea of Galilee. It's a beautiful place. And Jesus may be there watching the sunrise but word gets around that he's out there and so people start trickling down and, and he starts a conversation. He starts going back and forth. Hey, Jesus, teach us, what did you say of the last synagogue? And they're, they're talking. And it was custom for the teacher when they were going to actually like, teach to, to sit down cross-legged. So they wouldn't stand up front. They would sit down. But if you're on a lake shore, Jesus like, can sit down, but then the crowd started pressing in, and people couldn't see, and they couldn't hear. So Jesus sees these boats, and he gets this idea, like, I'll get in the boat, we'll go a little bit offshore, and make like an amphitheater, right? I can sit down, they can fan out on the, the lake shore, and, and everything will be great. And hey, you know, this boat actually belongs to somebody I've met before, somebody I've helped before. Maybe he'll help me. And so when Simon gets there, Jesus says, hey, man, can you help me out? And this seems like such a small thing. But in this moment, their relationship fundamentally changes. Up to this point, it's been almost completely one-sided, right? Jesus gives and Simon receives. Jesus gives teaching and preaching. Jesus gives wisdom and encouragement. He's been providing for needs. He's even, even given healing to his mother-in-law. And maybe Jesus got a lunch out of it or something. But, like, for the most part, Jesus gives and the people receive. But in this moment, the tables turn and it's Jesus asking something of Simon. There is something that Simon has. Hey, Simon. There's something that Simon has. That's literally Simon. Simon's right there. Not biblical Simon, but Simon. There is something Simon has or can do that this great teacher, preacher, healer, local minor celebrity needs. And even if only in the smallest of ways, it turns it into a reciprocal relationship. It goes from a one-way thing to a two-way thing. And it opens up all sorts of possibilities, as we'll see when we dig into the story. And so my question to you is, have you made this shift in your relationship with Jesus? Is Jesus someone you admire, love to listen to, that you turn to in times of need? Or is Jesus also someone who asks something of you? Is, someone, is Jesus someone who can ask something of you? Is Jesus real and active? Two weeks ago, we all got together and excitedly proclaimed that Jesus is alive. Is Jesus still alive? And, and where is this Jesus? And is this alive Jesus someone we can talk to? And when we talk to this alive Jesus, does that alive Jesus talk back to us in a way that doesn't make us feel crazy? Is Jesus, like, or is Jesus just some historical idea that's alive and we love revisiting it from time to time? Or is Jesus a real God that you are in relationship with? And how about this? Do you see yourself as someone who has something to offer that Jesus might invite you to contribute. 
You know, this is the dividing line between being a fan and being a disciple. Now, there is far more to discipleship than this, but this is where it has to begin. If we're going to actively follow Jesus and be the kind of disciples that Jesus seeks, we have to see Jesus not simply as someone to admire and take advice from, but to see him as someone who can and does ask something of us. And look, Simon might not totally get it yet. This just might feel like, hey, paying back for the whole mother-in-law thing. It's the least he can do, right? It uh, might not feel that momentous. But here's what I believe to be true. The call of God in most people's lives starts like this. Small. Seemingly insignificant. Honestly, not that much of a sacrifice. It's within our gifts or abilities or resources. Perhaps it's a minor inconvenience or a detour. Can you do this one little thing for me, Jesus asks. Can you stop and talk to that person? Can you show love to someone who's feeling excluded? Can you meet a small need? Can you clean up a mess someone else left? Can you make a donation? Can you offer to make a call or a connection for someone else? Can you join a service project with friends you were probably already going to hang out with anyway? But you see, Simon didn't have to say yes, and we don't either. Simon had multiple excuses to use, and so do we. Simon could have said, Jesus, man, I am tired. Anyone ever pull that one out on Jesus? I'm tired. Jesus, I'm not feeling it, man. Maybe tomorrow. Let's get back here. Same time, same bat channel tomorrow. We'll do this thing tomorrow. Jesus, I have other things to do. Or the one that I pull out a lot. Well, I don't have anything later, but I need to do this now. I can't put it off. I used to work in college campus ministry for close to a decade. Here was my favorite excuse. Well, I can't commit to that because I don't know what my homework's going to be like that day. That's funny, because you don't worry about that when you bought football tickets or basketball tickets. Or to take the route Miss Dana took. Do we see ourselves as worthy? Jesus would ask something of me? Surely there's someone better equipped or more important to ask than me. Certainly someone has a better boat prepared to be a, a stage. But Simon says yes. And because he does, their relationship changes and it opens up the potential for even more. One day Jesus was standing beside the Sea of Galilee when the crowd pressed in around him to hear God's word. Jesus saw two boats sitting by the lake. The fishermen had gone ashore and were washing their nets. Jesus boarded one of the boats, the one that belonged to Simon, then asked him to row out a little distance from the shore. Jesus sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. And when he finished speaking to the crowds, he said to Simon, row out farther into the deep water and drop your nets for a catch. See, the question goes from, can I use your boat to, do you want to go fishing? And that is a completely different question that we'll tackle next week. This is a story that has three major shifts in it. We're going to break it down. We're going to stay in this story for the next couple of weeks and look at each of these shifts. But this first, most basic, most initial shift, one that I would imagine many of you have already made, but sometimes we we tend to fall back to the other side of having made it sometimes, is seeing Jesus as someone not simply to admire and seek help from and seek refuge in, but to see Jesus as someone who can and does ask us for something, both as individuals and also as a church. We've talked about this a little bit just in passing earlier this year. We are entering into a process of revisiting our vision here at Lakeside. This fall, this October, we will celebrate 25 years as a church, which for a church planted in like kind of the 90s forward is actually a really big accomplishment to still be here 25 years later. But also, has anyone noticed that the world has kind of completely changed in like the last five or six years. We need to discern who God wants us to be and what God wants us to do here and now. Every church will always love God, love neighbor, and make disciples if they're on the right mission. 
But the question is, what does it look like here with us? And I don't just mean generally us. I mean us, the people in the room, the people watching, the people who were here in 830, the people who will be with us in the coming weeks. What does it look like for us with our interests, our resources, our abilities here in this real community, in this real church, in this time of the world? So we'll do different things. We'll have some surveys. We'll do some group discussions. We'll have some creative opportunities. And the first one is in the lobby right now. You'll get a chance to do that after church today and over the next couple of weeks. But I also want to say that absolutely everyone is invited to participate, no matter how long or not you have been here. If you want to grow in your faith through Lakeside, if you want to be a part of this church answering God's call and being the hands and feet of Christ in this community, then you have a part to play in this, no matter how long you've been here or not been here. And this series is meant to be an invitation to move in this direction, to begin this season. And and I hope that all of these messages will also impact you individually, because for some of you, you may be like, I'm here on Sunday, you know, I'm, I'm not ready to be that committed yet, that seems like really intense. Hopefully you'll still get something for your individual lives, but I also hope that it will guide us collectively in our prayers, in our listening, in our conversations, our thinking, and our planning as a church. So for us, the The collective invitation is also to see that Jesus asks churches and communities and groups of people to do things as well. This is the beginning of a vision for a church. And so out in the lobby, um, we have our display on on that wall in the cafe. And um, what's funny is that that display that's up all the time that we just kind of repurposed is actually, it looks kind of like a trammel net. We've got a big grid and then a tiny grid inside of it. And so that is kind of cool coincidence. But hanging from that are some blank tags. And then in little baskets are some smaller tags. And we'll refresh them as, as, uh, as you start using them. I invite you to, to take a tag off of the frame and grab a marker. And I want you to just write something. And you don't have to do it today. It'll be up for the next two weeks. But you can start today. we got plenty of tags. Things like, write things like prayers or thoughts or a single word that God places on your heart. Ideas, verses, quotes, song lyrics. I mean, this is an opportunity to scare the fish, as it were, and capture it, (laughs) right? You could be like, hey, we did this in my church in 1972, and I think it would work in 2024. Okay, write it down. Put it on a tag. We'll take a look at it. This is our chance to begin to bubble up to the surface what God is planting in our hearts, and what we're going to look for is patterns. What we're going to look for is passion. What we're going to look for is God's calling. We're going to look for things that resonate, and so don't just write things. Don't just draw things. Like the very first tag up there was my daughter who wrote children's movies every week at church. You can write whatever you want, but I invite you, too, to look at what other people write. And let that inspire you. See, like, I never thought of that, but I like that. I'm going to write that too. And so I invite you to respond in this way over the next couple of weeks. Now, as we transition from the sermon time to our confirmation time, let us pray together. Oh God, we give you thanks for this day and for all of your blessings. We thank you for the gift that this church community is and has been for the last nearly 25 years. For all the people that have come through this place, for all the people that have come to this place, for all of us who are here now, we are grateful that both as individuals and a community, we have the honor of being asked by you to participate in the salvation of all creation, of the kingdom of heaven coming on earth as it is in heaven. And so I pray that you would inspire us over these next couple of weeks for the tags, but over these next couple of months that we would begin to pray and we would ask you to speak and we would ask you to ask us stuff, that we would listen in our prayers, that we would listen to one another, that you would use all of the ways, both here at this place and when we're out in the community, to listen to our neighbors and coworkers and the people that we pass on the street, that you would give us a heart for this community, that you would give us a heart and a new vision, God, or a confirmation of our current vision that we may faithfully follow you. We pray all this in your name.